Hi, uh, my name is Ali. Uh, I am a PhD candidate in University of Oslo in the Intervention Center, uh, Oslo University Hospital in Norway. Um, I'm a part of the big group as well. Um, and I think uh, I'll go with the approach that Andy took that I'll, rather than mentioning more of the projects, I will focus just on one that I feel is a bit more interesting for the audience over here. So the title of my presentation is Estimation of Left Ventricular Pressure Displacement Loops Using Cardiac Accelerometers. Okay, so uh, before jumping to my own project, um, uh, I want to go through a couple of slides just to mention the background a bit so that you can understand why we are doing what we are doing. Um, probably you have seen this kind of image before. It shows a uh, pressure volume loop. Uh, theoretically, pressure volume loops are a representative of uh, the work done by the heart. Uh, a considerable amount of information on cardiac performance can be determined from uh, these pressure volume or PV loops, uh, such as stroke volume, cardiac output, <clears throat> injection fraction, myocardial contractility, etc., etc. But uh, practically, these loops are harder to calculate as they require invasive uh, ventricular pressure, which is hardly ever done in patients due to uh, stroke risks. Um, so due to that, the classical uh, volume loop principle inspired other novel loop analysis methods, such as uh, the pressure strain loop method, uh, as shown in the figure over here. Uh, pressure, uh, pressure strain loop area affects uh, the regional myocardial work, uh, this method employed uh, longitudinal strain instead of the ventricle volume, but the clinical use of this index is still limited uh, because it still needs uh, invasive pressure for the left ventricle. Another method is the pressure displacement loop. Pressure displacement loop area um, uh, is the kind of loop where the displacement is obtained uh, from the accelerometer recordings or the accelerometers uh, attached to the heart. Um, previously, our group has shown uh, that motion sensors or small accelerometers attached to the heart can be used to monitor cardiac function. Um, and our group showed that the pressure displacement loop, um, uh, pressure displacement loops had high sensitivity and specificity for the de for detection of uh, ischemia in animal models. Um, pressure displacement loops may be a good functional parameter, but they also require invasive measurements of the ventricular pressure, which is again not performed in clinical practice. Therefore, we need a way to estimate the left ventricular pressure without risks. And the aim of the study that I'm going to present was fourfold. Uh, the first one uh, was to detect the opening and closing of the mitral and aortic valves. Uh, using the cardiac accelerometers. Uh, second one was to generate a reference left ventricular pressure curve. And I would say the main aim was to estimate the left ventricular pressure curve using uh, the, the first two aims, using the detected valve events from our accelerometer readings and uh, the reference curve that we, had that we had generated in our second aim. And finally, combining all these three, we would be able um, to plot or generate the pressure displacement loops that I just showed you in the previous slide. That's our ultimate end target. Okay, so uh, this figure shows a representative example of the data that was col uh, that was collected during our experiments in animal models. Um, the dashed lines uh, show the four valve events, the opening and closing of the mitral and aortic valves uh, that we are interested in. Um, we wanted to see, oh, sorry, we wanted to see if um, uh, these vibrations could be automatically detected um, through the SLO readings or not, which would later be used to estimate uh, the left ventricle pressure trace. Okay, so the algorithm that was used to detect um, uh, the valve winds is a bit too complex to go into detail right now. But briefly, what we did was that we took um, the three axis uh, data from the, acceler um, the accelerometer and converted into a single Euclidean acceleration. We used uh, standard filters and featured extraction methods to and detect our four points of interest uh, in each individual heart cycle. The four um, uh, points of interest being the opening and closing uh, of the mitral and aortic valve. 
and that takes and this was the like i mentioned the first aim uh, of our study and that takes us to the second aim of the study the generation of the reference curve uh, once we had the uh, points in um, a multiple of uh, traces uh, we generated a reference curve by averaging um, a normalized uh, um, uh, pressure trace the black line in this um, uh, video shows the the sorry oops i think i'll have to go through again yeah so what we did was that we um, the points were adjusted to an arbitrarily selected time length and the peak pressure was normalized so that all the pressure traces had the same peak value so this was done for uh, multiple pressure traces until we could average the traces to get the reference curve the black line over here which was then used to um, generate pressure traces for other um, detective wall winds. This takes us to um, our third target, the estimating of the left ventricle pressure uh, trace. Uh, imagine that you do have the four wall winds detected from the, SL, uh, from the accelerometer. Uh, we adjusted the reference trace uh, back uh, to the detected um, wall winds, and we could then estimate um, um, the, the pressure trace for that particular heartbeat. Uh, the video is in a loop. I will let it play for one or two times so that everyone understands what I'm trying to say, and I'll repeat it once more. So once we had the four wall winds through the accelerometer, uh, we could use the reference curve that's shown by the black line uh, in this um, in this video playing, and we could if and we adjusted the opening and closing of the wall winds in the black line to our detected four wall winds from the acceleration trace. Once that was done and the peak value of the reference adjusted to the peak pressure value measured in refer um, um, uh, measured uh, um, uh, in parallel with acceler acceleration traces, in theory, uh, we could have the same uh, pre estimated pressure curve uh, that was recorded in parallel with the acceleration traces. So the green one represents uh, the actual measured pressure trace while the black one in the last, uh, well, while the black one represents um, our estimated one. Wait, I'll let it finish and then I'll point out which point am I saying it to. So yeah, at this point, the black one is the estimated pressure trace, while the green one is the actual measured pressure trace. And you can see they're pretty, uh, pretty close to each other. Okay, so this took us to the fourth aim, to generate the pressure displacement uh, loops. So, uh, finally, when we both have, when we had both the estimated trace uh, as from the previous uh, two videos and the displacements that we took from the acceleration recordings, we could plot the pressure displacement loops. Um, I've shown an example how the loops would differ between normal baseline conditions and let's say in uh, myocardial ischemia. Uh, the red one, um, a pressure dis a pressure displacement loops represent the loops that are plotted by using the actual measured pressure traces, while the blue, um, uh, the blue loops are the ones that are plotted using uh, our method's estimated pressure traces. And you can see, yes, that there is um, a bit of a difference, uh, which is to be expected, but still uh, they are pretty close uh, to what we would have hoped or what we would have expected. So to conclude, uh, we were able to detect the wall winds with sufficient accuracy using our um, cardiac accelerometers. We were also able to estimate the left ventricular pressure trace using those uh, detected wall winds from the accelerometer. And finally, uh, we could plot the pressure displacement loops in which the pressure was estimated again from the accelerometer and the displacement was also taken from the accelerometer. So in theory, uh, the figure that I showed in you in this previous slide, this one, all uh, like uh, the blue loops has been plotted using just uh, the, SL uh, the accelerometer, um, the cardiac accelerometer and nothing else. So yes, so therefore we believe uh, that this method now enables extraction of new functional indices uh, that were not possible before. And this does in fact improve the monitoring of the heart. Thank you. Excellent. Yep, I'm done. <laughs> Thanks for your quick and really clear presentation. Fritz. 
Hopefully you can uh, talk. Uh, your mic seems to be on, but uh, we cannot hear you, Fritz. Yeah, and I think that the issue is persistent. So you might want to type the question instead of talking. That is, it looks like your mic is not working. Uh, I think that Fritz is right. Question, any other question from anybody? If I may then, Ali, I wonder, you have uh, personalized the events, but uh, how about personalizing the, I uh, fitting the, the amplitude of the pressures? The yeah, <laughs> I, I actually did not mention that on purpose, so I, because I wanted somebody to ask so that I can explain it better. Like I said, uh, we have to match the peak uh, left ventricular pressure as well to get the exact estimate um, of the LV, um, yeah, LV trace. Right now, because we had recorded uh, the pressure uh, invasively in the animals as well, so we did end up using those ones. But in theory or in practice, well, we could use brachial pressure as well uh, to estimate uh, the pressure, uh, the left ventricle pressure. That uh, will be as close as you can get, um, for now at least, until we come up or somebody comes up with a better way uh, to get the uh, LV pressure because brachial pressure is the only pressure that's non-invasively available in patients right now and that will take you as close to the LV pressure as possible. Okay. Uh, the question from Fritz, I'll read yes. you. Uh, why use of different butter wall filters for that? Different, different oh. Yeah, okay. Um, I won't try to sound smart uh, by saying that why did I use which ones? To be honest, I was uh, I tried multiple different things, uh, multiple different filters to get the best results for each event, and I just ended up with using uh, the ones that I did use. Basically, it was a hit and trial method, I would say. Okay. And these were the ones that showed me the best results, and uh, I ended up going with uh, with these. Okay, Fritz, if you have any follow up question, just type it. Otherwise, I will jump into the next one. Joao. I think Mandy was first. Go to Mandy first. Okay, I didn't see that round, that hand raising. Yeah, Mandy, I pressed the button by accident. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, yeah, so it's very nice work, Ali. Uh, going back to the slim uh, slurometer data. Yeah, it looks very similar to the hard sound, right? So, uh, and again, we see yeah. similar things. We, and compared to what Merck that presented. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, in, in a way it is similar. I, I might I even dare I even say the same because the sounds are produced by some vibrations, right? Exactly. So in a way, either you can measure the vibrations as a sound or you can measure the actual vibrations using the SLR and the SLR meter. Exactly. So yes, I would say that they might be the same thing. I'm using the word might because I, I don't want to, yeah, I will use the word might. Yeah, yeah I was going to, yeah, ask that if, but if yes, you are in, actually not going to do no, it no. together, like if no, you no, put no, but in you, uh, a micro together with the accelerometer in the same heart, it would be super cool. I mean, if you would end up with the same results. True, true. I mean, intuitively, you are absolutely right that both are the same thing. Because said acceleration or well the sound is uh, produced from the heart what might differ a bit is that where are you placing those two things and okay. the vibration sounds might differ a bit but yeah but but even if you are able to translate from uh, yeah place in the heart like the accelerometer to the body yeah. then if you are able to do this transfer function it's amazing because then you can record all of these non-invasively. I don't know how easy is that to do. True, true. I mean, I, I guess a mathematician would be able to do that way better than I would because I'm not a mathematician and I don't think I will be able to do the transfer functions <laughs> properly. So, yeah, but sure, if you're willing to help us over here, you're most welcome. Who, me? No, yes. I, oh, okay. the master people have much more experience. I, I okay. don't Say random stuff. Fair yeah. enough. Thank I you. I don't know whether Matt, that you you want to step into the discussion. Uh, for the accelerometer, I should say that any 
uh, disturb in the system in the, any variables that you have. For example, you have pressure, you have acceleration, you have displacement. Mm -hmm. Any disturbance in the system which makes a mechanical vibration is a sound. It depends on the frequency of that vibration. True. If it is above 20 hertz, it makes a sound. Yeah. And therefore, the thoracic uh, function or effect on the sound or on the signals mm -hmm. we use here the, in my presentation, I didn't mention that. Mm -hmm. We use a filtering method, which is uh, published a long time ago by Dorand, mm -hmm. and for the effect of the thorax on the sound. And it just it makes attenuation on the uh, mitra component and aortic component of the sound. And maybe Ali can use that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, 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 you definitely gave a better definition or a correlation between the the heart sounds and the acceleration than I did. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, thanks Boys. a lot, Karim. Um, I, follow up. Yeah. Yeah, I see that Fritz has a question. Yeah, so Fritz, I didn't mention, uh, let's say, the definitions of the opening and closing of the wall vents just for time's sake, but I'll just go, quickly go through all four of them. Um, we did not take uh, the hard sounds uh, as the opening or closing of the wall vents. How we defined the wall vents was the mitral valve closure. I, I hope that you can see my screen because I've gone, gone into sure. the, yeah. Um, the, the, the part where it says MVC, the metal valve closure, uh, was defined as uh, where we had the peak uh, left ventricle volume. Uh, the mitral valve opening uh, was defined as the point where the left ventricular pr pressure goes below uh, the left atrial pressure in diastole. Um, the aortic valve opening was defined as the first upstroke point of the aortic pressure um, and the aortic valve closure was defined as the point where the rate of decrease of left ventricular pressure is the highest. But you said you also determined it from the from the accelerometers in slide eight, right? Yes, true, yes. And uh, what is, what, so what you is made the switch there from, from the hemodynamically measured? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay. So, okay. Sorry, I misunderstood your question. The, the points that I was, uh, the definitions that I was telling you right now, these were the hemodynamically defined points or let's say the ground truth that we wanted to achieve. Yeah. What we did achieve by, uh, let me go on slide eight, the one that you, yeah, this one, by using uh, different, uh, we were able to manipulate the Euclidean acceleration so, um, to the points where certain points, or let's say those four points that we were interested in were more attenuated or more uh, more prominent. And then by just using normal feature extraction methods, we were able to get those uh, four points. So, um, I mean, I, I think it has nothing to do with the, with the sound ones. We just manipulated the Euclidean acceleration to mm -hmm. uh, give us those four points. Yeah, I've seen these kind of indications yeah. in other papers as well but in my experience these are kind of idealized signals and not what you regularly find so i wonder how reproducible you can find these uh, valve openings uh, mm. in particular um i i guess i i guess i do agree with you or to a certain extent that yes usually uh, these things are idealized but again we have to start from an idealized uh, the first step is supposed to be idealized and then probably the second step um to transfer, yeah, and the data available. But yeah, I do agree. This was the first idealized step, and hopefully, the next step would be to translate them to other, um, let's say, non not ideal conditions as well. Espen. Yes, I uh, just want to say uh, we just had this study published uh, a couple of weeks back. So it's now available online at a uh, scientific report. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot more details there. Um, <coughs> also with respect to the accuracy of the uh, detection of these events uh, compared to the hemodynamically reference points. And uh, Ali, he, uh, we had a large uh, database of former 
animal experiments in different conditions. So we, we tested this in quite a few conditions, but of course not everything. So, but uh, it seems to work fairly well, but it's and also actually in the closed chest condition. So, but um, yeah, check out the paper. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more info there. That was my point. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So I think the discussion points have been closed to whichever level we can reach at this point. Any other comment? Any other suggestion? Jorge. I have a question regarding the feeding of the of the pressure tracers for the estimation. Um, how do you constrain the shape of the trace to the reference one? Do you use like a, a PCA model or or how do you constrain that shape? Um, Jorge, from what I understand your question, I mean, I don't think we constrain the shape. Uh, the reference curve is an averaged um, trace from different conditions. So, of course, it, it's not 100% ideal. Of course, there will be differences um, here and there. It's just an estimate. But, I mean, if you go to slice number nine, I think it was. Ooh, which slice? Uh, yes, yes, this or one. No, 10. Yeah. Number 10? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that one, the video. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So basically, you have the reference um, trace, yeah. right? Yeah. And now you need to feed the, you need to feed the reference trace to the, to the green line. Yeah. Which is yeah. your... Which your is the actual measured one. Yes. Yes. So how do you do this, this feed? That, that is my question. By, by the four uh, points. So the green dashed lines represent the opening and the closing of the events. Uh, detected by the um, by the accelerometer, and if you see, we move the black line, uh, the opening and closing of the wall winds of these of the reference black line to these green points. If you notice, all points will mm -hmm. coincide with the dashed line. But and the, then my, you have my, my question is what what is the constraint with respect to the rest of the points so they move in accordance to those points? So basically, you have five points that you are fitting. Yeah. Uh, how do you make sure that the others one move accordingly? Well, that's my point. Okay, you you don't you interpolate uh, the the points in between. Because you have the let's say the first point and the last point. You don't correlate each and every point in the middle. You basically uh, correlate the first point, let's say, of that part of the trace and the last point. Okay. The thing is, I I would be able to explain this to you way better on a whiteboard. If you're in front of me, <laughs> yeah, maybe we, draw. Can, maybe we can follow up later. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Because for, for me, it's not a linear interpolation. Clearly, it's like it, it has a certain shape information or a trace information. And point is, black reference curve that's fitted to the other one, it retains its shape. It just, um, uh, how, do you say, um, how do you say, it's linearly interpolated in the x axis. But the, it retains its shape. If I, may, if I may close the discussion, I think, Jorge, I think it's a piecewise linear interpolation, that's all. On okay. engineering side, I'm stepping in without knowing the details, but I think that uh, if you want to know more, you can definitely touch base with Ali. Yeah. <laughs>